Okay, let's start, shall we? Okay. Greetings, everyone, and good morning um, to all of you on this, um, well, beautiful, sunny day in London. I don't know um, what it's looking like where you are. My name is Amina Yakin. I'm the director of the SOAS Festival of Ideas. This is our fifth day. The festival theme is dedicated to decolonizing knowledge. We have had um, an invigorating four days of um, debates and discussions from various disciplines and researchers talking about um, stuff from um, how we decolonize our research methods to how we decolonize the curriculum in the classroom. Um, and uh, we are also in conversation with colleagues working on themes of decolonizing um, at SOAS and they are in conversation with their partners and collaborators and researchers uh, from a variety of Global South locations ranging across Africa, Asia, the Middle East and it's been an absolute, um, I think, um, learning, massive learning experience for all of us to be in the same sort of virtual spaces this this format the zoom format allows us to to sort of do that and to be uh, to have conversations and dialogues that perhaps um, we um, would be having differently in other other ways um, and today it gives me great pleasure in this particular session which is uh, devoted to how perhaps we think about decolonizing the study of Pakistan which um, uh, often focuses on ideas of development and um, various contexts in which it is thought of as um, as a place which is on the brink in terms of its political um, stability and in um, so we uh, what what's exciting about uh, the research on the subject at on or on Pakistan at both at SOAS and with our um, research colleagues that we have invited to these conversations is that they are talking about this work in different and innovative directions and one such person who is with us today is um, the wonderful and uh, distinguished speaker and researcher uh, Dr. Amine Hothi. She is a um, fellow at Lucy Cavendish College, Cambridge, an honorary professor at the University of Nottingham and um, program director at the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan. Her CV is vast, so I'm just giving you selected highlights of where her various locations have been. Um, at the AGC Pakistan, she overlooks the Sirat program at 200 universities of the country. And uh, the I've come to know Amine through her project that uh, she was a part of with Professor Akbar Ahmed on journey into Europe and um, really got an opportunity to understand the important interventions that she's making with regards to gender, to peace building and to human rights and women's rights in her work. And all of these things is what she is encouraging with chairs in um, Pakistan through the Sirat program in the country's universities on global peace, human rights, women's rights, seeking education. So um, Amine, that's just you know, wonderful to see and, and such an inspiration. And um, she, in her PhD at the University of Cambridge, she studied the tribal areas of Pakistan adjoining her fieldwork area. And um, through her work, she, she's been encouraging gender studies and involving students who will study, who are studying women in their natural social environments in Muslim societies. And in the West, and another big part of Amine's work is interfaith. And interfaith is something um, that she's been teaching in the UK, University of Cambridge, and in Islamabad, Jordan, Abu Dhabi, Qatar. I hope I've got all the places uh, correctly. And today, the book that we are here to celebrate is the book that is um, connected 
deeply to this work on interfaith and it's um, Gems and Jewels, the Religions of Pakistan. It is based on interfaith dialogue and studies of religious minorities in Pakistan. And um, I'm very, very excited that she has agreed to speak to us about it today and will be um, talking, will be in conversation about it. And I'd just like to share a uh, something uh, from the foreword from His Royal Highness Prince Al Hassan bin Talal and his um, comment on the book. And he says, in a welcome counter narrative to the media portrayal of a nation of rigid and at times militant exclusivism and extre extremism, the troubled child of South Asia, abundant in natural and historical riches, but plagued with political instability, Hothi shows us a land and a people of fascinating depth and sophistication. And he says, and this is an endorsement that I think any all of us would want for our books. He says, this book is a glorious read, accessible, enjoyable, a radiating resonance of vivid human images, voices, faces and places, and a celebration of the richness of diversity that connects us with the beauty of the different and the human character at its best. Um, Amine, I've been reading the book and it's just absolutely, I've, I've loved the tone of it, the celebration of the different religions. And I think we're talking about this at a time when uh, sectarian divisions in, in Pakistan are at a high point. So it, it's really important to have a book like this that talks about religions in Pakistan. So I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you this morning for joining us and thank you so much for being um, part of the Festival of Ideas. And I'd like to just invite you to, to tell us a little bit about the inspiration for this book. Thank you very much, Dr. Amina Yakin, for that very warm welcome. I don't deserve it, but I really appreciate it. Thank and thank you to all your uh, technical support and your friends back there who are making it all happen, Sunil and my other friend there. Uh, thank you for this wonderful team who are playing such an important role at university and really bringing in key and cutting edge ideas. And that's what we've really got to do. Uh, at university campuses. So I really appreciate your work, Dr. Amina, thank you. I want to step back for a minute um, and I want to, of course, thank all the audience and participants here. Uh, and I want to introduce you a little bit to where I grew up and how I grew up in the field uh, because I grew up accompanying my father who's also an anthropologist and a field worker he was also a civil servant in Pakistan, and we traveled uh, across Waziristan, Balochistan. These are you know, some of the very tribal areas in Pakistan from one end to the other, which was Swat, Swat to Waziristan, Balochistan. And his roots were really in Soaz because that's where he did his PhD. And that's where he was, in, he was engaging with these intellectual ideas, but also being challenged by his professors and his uh, elders. So really, he was, um, again, asking those key questions, who am I, what, a, what is education for, etc. So that's my background. And I grew up with professors, Professor Geertz and Professor Larry Rosen, who are really big giants in the social sciences, and particular, particularly in my field, uh, which is social anthropology. So I'm now a social scientist and educationist tra trained for a PhD in social anthropology at the University of Cambridge. But my first encounter with social anthropology was at LSE at the London School of Economics where I read this very big book uh, by Malinowski who's the founding father of anthropology. And the book was called The Sexual Lives of Savages. And then another book was called Frederick Barth, and he wrote on the Swat Batans. And both books showed me as a student how far these authors were from the perspectives of the peoples studied. And one day I wanted to, when you know I got there at that stage myself, I would have loved to 
challenge those ideas in a positive, constructive way. And to some extent, that's what I did in my PhD on the uh, on Pukhtuns of Northern Pakistan. So I looked at gender, I looked at uh, uh, people from within the society, the Pukhtun society, who were studied previously from a sort of outsider male perspective almost. So my perspective was able to challenge or re-look at those ideas, but from the women's point of view and from the house, the inside out. And that was a really interesting study for me because I was able to, in some way, uh, find my voice and space within academia. And of course, I was studying at Cambridge with a supervisor who was challenging in somewhat a difficult way and also unfamiliar with my area. So that really raised a lot of fundamental and big questions for me in academia. What was education for at universities? Was it, how did it define my identity as a South Asian, British, uh, young female? How, did, how was it giving shape to me? And was university, were, was university education really for uh, other things like just because simply it was the things the thing to do, for example, in Australia, there's a concept of the walkabout, or was it finding identity? Was it to impart knowledge or to understand ourselves and others? Was, or was it to be a, simply a good human being? So I, uh, I was asking myself these questions. How can knowledge benefit both us and the people in the field in real, tangible and profound, even spiritual ways? How can our knowledge build bridges and do away with the walls of hatred and misunderstanding that I saw around me? And to some extent, even in those books, I found uh, the, the differences between cultures and religions and I wanted to address that to some extent. So after the LSE in Cambridge, I was appointed the first director and became co-founder of the Center for the Study of Muslim Jewish Relations in Cambridge. This allowed me to combine my anthropology with sociology, religion, peace building, interfaith, to see how we could bridge that Muslim Jewish divide. And by pioneering these courses in the 800 year history of Cambridge, we were able to bring different religious communities together and some, some rabbis and priests went on to do community projects in London. So I saw hostilities change to friendships, which was really interesting. And then later on in Pakistan at FC College, I was able to introduce interdisciplinary courses for undergraduate students. Here too, some boys who had said, you know, uh, we want to uh, maybe um, ha they had some sort of perspective which was negative towards other communities, began to empathize because one of our courses was called empathy and we sort of deconstructed the idea of empathy and how sophisticated and important it is for a society to begin to understand the other. And so for me as a teacher, seeing the perspective change in students' minds and perspectives was fantastic and it was a big moment for me. So my new book, Gems and Jewels, The Religions of Pakistan, and I'd like to just hold up a dummy of the book here so you know how big it is and it's got many uh, different faiths, about 10 faith communities uh, who we explore in the book. So I began to set out and learn about different faith communities in Pakistan. And I found that the image of Pakistan was very problematic because it was often described as rigid, as a monolith. There was no complexity in the image of Pakistan. It was a very black and white image. And in reality, as I explored Pakistan and met different communities and different people, there was this fantastic array of diversity I was able to meet and interview in this book, for example, about 10 different faith communities, including Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Jews, the Jews of Pakistan, Parsis, the Kalasha, the Sikhs, the Buddhists, the Baha'is, and so forth. And what did I learn? For example, I learned a couple of different things. I learned that a particular branch of Buddhism was nurtured in present-day Pakistan. 
with one of the oldest universities in Gandhara, in the Gandhara region. Uh, I learned that Sikhism was born in Pakistan in Nan Nankana. And some of the most important religious Hindu sites, the Sanatan Dharam, are in Pakistan. For example, Raj Katas, which I call interfaith jewels. I discovered the Jews of Pakistan, and they were very hospitable. I met Rabbi Aftab and went to the Jewish graveyard in Karachi. And this for me was fascinating because, you know, in the popular image of Pakistan, you you see um, a certain image, which is often negative, but you don't see complexity, you don't see diversity. So this was fascinating for me. And then in the book, we explore uh, two Parsi sisters. And Parsi is again, a, another faith for another name for Zoroastrianism. So the two sisters are Rati and Perrin. And one sister is in India and one sister is in Pakistan. And it shows, the book shows, and through their interviews, we see how boundaries divide just ordinary human beings and how difficult this boundary of not just the physical boundary, but also the idea of hating each other or despising the other or the neighbor has brought so many problems to everyday ordinary people like these two sisters. So it's a beautiful story and a very moving story. And both, this, both the sisters, are very compassionate and loving. So it's even more um, profound when you study their story. And then of course, uh, lastly, I've uh, put the order of the book, the, the smallest community first, and the biggest community in terms of population last, because it's a certain South Asian respect where you say it's an adab or respect for the other. And therefore, the biggest community, which is the Muslim community, is uh, towards the end of the book. And I explore these wonderful saints, for example, Shah Abdul Latif Betai, who wrote a beautiful book called the Shah Jorisalo. And that itself is known as the Quran or the Bible of Sindh of this area, because Pakistan is divided, as you know into uh, four or five regions. And one of the regions in the South is Sindh. And about 300 years ago, Shah Abdul Latif Betai writes a beautiful book called the Shah Jo Risalo, in which he explores seven stories. And these are called the seven queens of Sindh. And each story is told in the voice of a woman. So the woman is the protagonist and we hear the story through her pain, through her challenges, through her difficulties. So again, we're ch challenging the idea of how gender is perceived in this region uh, so long ago in Pakistan. And I found that these stories were not explored either in the curriculum or uh, in the national narrative. And I would like to promote that idea because I, I will uh, explain why later on. So, the story was no, lo no longer of us versus them, but this was my story of learning about our human family, because here was such a fantastic array of diverse communities. So I called the religious communities gems, because each faith community has its treasures and gems of stories to tell. And each of us, though we have our own perspectives, must give the respect and space to hear the other. So what moves them, what makes them cry, what makes them joyous, all these come out in the book. But there's one factor that unites them all, and that is their poverty. So through their poverty, you see that simple humanity of reaching out, living together side by side. What are the challenges? What are the difficulties they face? What they, They're still facing racism or sectarianism, et cetera but they're also united. We don't get that complexity in the media, unfortunately. So in the conclusion and in the last few points, uh, Dr. Akin and my friends here, uh, I want to tell you <clears throat> or ask this question, how can I apply my knowledge to understand diverse people, seemingly different from me, for example? This is what I've asked in the book. And I've said my studies, research, books and teachings all taught me that knowledge must be used for a higher purpose, for the betterment of the collective human family. In the field, we as social scientists, <coughs> excuse me, 
we take risks. As scholars, we have to visit fields, different uh, field areas. As a woman, you have to reach out even more, leave your family. These are all very difficult challenges within that region. But we must create courses which are interdisciplinary as scholars by understanding, by reaching out, by visiting, by listening to different perspectives and to, by hearing the pain because the world is already in so much pain. There are genocides in different areas of the world. We have a crisis with global economy. We've got poverty. We've got racial prejudices and hatred. So the steps are, uh, I would suggest the first step is to hear and acknowledge the human pain in each community. Each community has its story. We must listen to that story and probably, if, even possibly visit the different sites, the sites of pain. Where did the, geno the genocide happen? Where did the stories take place? Where did the stories of origin take place? So it's to learn and teach because I see myself, and I'm sure many of you do, see yourselves as a teacher, but also as a student. We're learning and we're teaching, we're passing on that knowledge. So knowledge in a university is and should be more than what it is. It is not old used books on dusty shelves or virtually accessible material with inaccessible language. language. Knowledge must be reassessed because knowledge is passing on the flame of peace, which can lead to world healing. Indeed, <coughs> excuse me, indeed, Akele Memembe, Mebembe, sorry, inspired Soaz's decolonizing knowledge the whole idea. South Asia in particular, and Pakistan and Indian, the, the Pakistani and Indian narratives have really adopted an anti-colonial narrative. And that in, in this narrative, um, they, it's, the narrative has built heroes to fight or to challenge the invading oppressive villains. And as a result, for example, you have communities such as the Ubandis who violently uh, oppose or, um, uh, you know, reject anything that is the other, especially Western or from the Raj time. And that sort of narrative is abrasive and violent. So even though the invaders may have come in other communities, for example, in Journey into Your Europe project, which Dr. Yakin is familiar with, we went to Bosnia and we witnessed Srebrenica. In that, the, a lot of the victims told us that the genocide was done in revenge for 200 years ago when the Turks came and invaded that region of the world in Europe. So my point is the cycle of revenge, the vicious revenge and anger and hatred towards the other must be countered. And I argue as a native woman who is using the perspective of the minorities who are misrepresented and faced double colonization, first from the British Raj and then from the South Asian elite. But especially for women, women face triple colonization because then you have the male perspective as well. So what, what I'm really arguing for, my theory is to decolonize the anti-colonization of the curriculum or the narrative that we have built up, which is a very, uh, it can lead to an abrasive, aggressive attitude. What I would like instead is to own our past and to see the pains, both the pains and the joys in order to heal because we need that healing. And so that will allow us to give way to diversity, to multicultural, multi-religious, multi-voiced and multi-narratives to make a harmonious, diverse, and respectful whole. So what needs to happen, in my humble opinion, in South Asia is that we need to hear more voices, more diverse, diverse voices, to listen to them, to understand and respect people, giving them full personhood. So each community, for example, here that I've explored in the book, should be allowed to be, um, it should be allowed to express their point of view and their stories. And we must hear and respect that. And to some extent, the uh, Council of Islamic Ideology in a recent code of ethics 
made 20 points. And one of the points in that is that my, uh, people who are non-Muslim in Pakistan must be given that respect and space to uh, both practice their religion and to be heard and to be respected. So this debate is ongoing and there are um, the areas where I have worked, for example, I've worked with the council and with the higher education commission. And I know that both are moving towards that direction. But also, uh, Dr. Yakin, in the UK, we need to teach this history of colonization and the decolonization of knowledge much more assertively, both in schools and in universities. Through books, for example, like Gems and Jewels, which gives space to multiple voices and perspectives. The other, because the challenge really is to own our past, as I said, with all its pains, to overcome this, uh, these challenges, because this is how we will work towards an enlightened future. And I think there's no better place to do this than at a university campus. This is why the SOAS event is so important and groundbreaking. So Dr. Yakin, I thank you once again for your very important work and that of your teams behind the scenes. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Hothi. That's uh, very kind and generous of you. I mean, it's I, you've raised so many important points and covered so many things that I wanted to talk to you about in, in separate parts. So forgive me if I return to some of the things that you mentioned so that we can have a longer conversation. And as we're talking, I also want to um, invite the participants to put their questions to you in the Q&A box. Uh, you'll find the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. And if you just send in your questions, we will take them at the end of our conversation and uh, try and answer as many as possible. The, the Q&A function allows you to submit your question anonymously or to put your name in as you submit it. So please, audience members, do um, feel free to start putting your questions across to us. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Hothi, I want to return to, I want to return to, um, your biography um, as part of this journey and um, what your uh, talk as an anthropologist, as a social anthropologist and what this book will talk more about the book as well. Uh, you mentioned growing up in Waziristan. And I was wondering if um, perhaps our audience members might not be familiar with the significance of Waziristan with regards to both the colonial past and uh, its positionality within Pakistan today. And of course, your own relationship to it, your familial con connections to it. Would it be something that you could um, tell us a little bit more about? Um, well, that's a really interesting question. Um, Waziristan is in the north of Pakistan and it's in on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. So it's, it was really a buffer zone uh, during the British colonial rule. So it neither became part fully integrated into Pakistan. And it was also a boundary where families were on both sides of Afghanistan and Pakistan. But because, because uh, in 1947, uh, the British laid the Durand line, so really cut the cut the land in two. And again, where I was mentioning the story of Rati and Perrin in my book, and that's the opposite side on the Eastern border where you have the, uh, the Indian Pakistan border. So there are families there who are separated. Similarly in Waziristan, you have this very important area with largely the Pukhtun tribe who are based there. And this was uh, a very significant area for both, uh, both in the colonial period, but also uh, for Pakistan, but never fully integrated into Pakistan because the Pukhtuns had their own identity. And that was called Pukhtun Wali, which is a code of honor. And it is a fantastic, you know, it, it is um, a very respectable and a very interesting culture in itself, but often misunderstood both by the center in uh, Pakistan and there's some tension there but also during the colonial period. And my father happened to be the political agent. So while he was there, I grew up 
and attended one of my first schools, which was under literally under a tree. And I had a little takhta and a little, you know, uh, those wooden pens. So we didn't really have the paper, pads, computers. Uh, things have really moved ahead since then. Mm -hmm. well, wonderful. Thank you. That's um, that's excellent to have that historical reference point. And um, I was just reading a section from your book and thinking about in a sense, what you've picked up there is is that very important narrative of identity formation and how people um, rec how people are recognized both by the state, by the center, by those around them, and how people recognize themselves within uh, through their kind of connections, primordial connections or <laughs> other connections, um, community connections, as you mentioned the the code of Wali and how um how that's understood from within the community and how that's recognized from outside the community and and in what ways that can lead to um particular types of challenges for um for how it how the i suppose broader um regions react to each other in that in those spaces not understanding because uh, you know the idea of nationalism is is of course that we all live together as one happy family but the reality of nationalism is that it doesn't quite happen and and people are pitted against each other within within the nation space and we see that quite a lot uh in in pakistan and um and and in your book You've been talking to a lot of students as well. I, I saw that and you've mentioned a few people there in your, um, the, the kind of Parsi sisters. I'm, I'm not sure, you know, whether they're students or they're, what stage they're at, but um, one, one of the people um, that you talked, uh, one, one of the pe women you talked to in the book was uh, with regards to people fleeing regions or being killed for um, especially students from, from minority communities and the fact that you've had situations where homes and villages have been uh, have been destroyed or, or they've been you know upsets or things that have led to a lot of um, dysfunctionality. And you say there are open, and if, if I can quote from the book, there are open wounds still hurting individuals, the nation, nations, and our world at large. And you say this situation led, led Farishta, who I interviewed, to say she feels conflicted in her identity as a member of the Parsi community from Pakistan, now living in Canada. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit, you know, those, those kind of interviews and identities the conflicted identities that you met and how you mediated or, or or sort of i suppose built that work in into your framework as a researcher i mean that particular example is from a from a parsi um um interviewee and i'm sure you will have had interviewees from other uh, communities perhaps that you might be closer to as well so how do you mediate with those across those those narratives of pain as it were and and um, understand how to construct your own narrative about in this book that you so beautifully present could could you sort of describe that journey a little bit that's <clears throat> a very good question dr yakin and there are many questions packed in that um, but I'll say that this, you're absolutely right. The uh, concept of conflicted identity, um, uh, though I would say right at the beginning is not confined to Pakistan alone. I think a lot of people, a lot of global citizens find themselves in such a situation. You know, you belong to so many different worlds. You have so many different identities. You have so many different layers of identities. One of the professors in, um, I think it was Ireland, described it as an onion. So it's the layers of identity that we all have and we all share. But going back to Pakistan, I would like to reiterate my point of really um, de decolonizing that anti-colonial narrative, because that anti-colonial narrative 
means that we are, as a nation, there is one uh, narrative which makes us more um, militant, or uh, I won't use the word militant in the way it's understood, but it makes any community more aggressive towards the other. So the same may be happening in India, the same may be happening in uh, Pakistan or Afghanistan, where you see the other as pitted against yourself. But as soon as we do this, what we are doing here, Dr. Yakin, which is to open up a dialogue and a conversation where we give respect and space to other people and different voices and really hear their pains. What are their stories? Where is everybody coming from? Can I step into their shoes and understand their perspectives? And as soon as we begin to do that, we see them not as us and them, not mm -hmm. as those walls that some uh, politicians or people in the world want to put up, but we see them as human beings. We see them as a potential brother, as a potential sister, and then it becomes a human family. And that's what I've really tried to emphasize. And that's why rather than an anti-colonial narrative, I would like to em our universities, both in the UK and in Pakistan to join up together and in South Asia, more largely in India in Bangladesh and other countries to join up and have this global discussion. How can we really as a world family begin to move ahead and stop really building those walls of hatred and disrespect because any community that's marginalized or uh, put into a block or into this stereotypical box is it's it's completely unfair as you know and i think that is something that needs to be challenged and we need to really begin to respect number one the individual number two the different communities within a nation and number three the nations itself they're no longer these debates about rich nations and poor nations but like decolonization we also have to respect each community and give them their full voice and space and perhaps be more empathetic mm -hmm. and understand, are they coming from a space of, is this um, aggression coming because of a certain history mm -hmm. that was imposed upon them? Or is it coming from you know, their own pain, their stories? So that's what we need to bring out. And of course, it needs much more discussion and many more courses, mm -hmm. but uh, this is what we did with the Muslim Jewish angle. And I really found that fascinating because I really saw those hostilities where, you know, in our classes, we had rabbis and we had imams. And then towards the end of the courses, they were able to sit together and really develop a friendship. And similarly with FC College, I know one of our students is here mm -hmm. uh, on the chat from Pakistan. Would so, you like me to read out the questions? Because we've got a few questions okay. coming up and they're really interesting. And I think it will okay. be um, it would be great if you if you might be able to engage with them. So should we start with the first question from Baha, who um, I think is a former uh, student. Students. Baha, yeah. uh, welcome Baha. So after participate, he's he, she, she, or he, he. Uh, he, okay, says after participating in your class back at FC College Lahore, we went individually and in groups to visit different religious places, people and their lives, eat with them, became friends. But in political and state level, the people are not allowed to build their religious building, even in Islamabad. <clears throat> How will your book contribute to influence the policy policymakers um, and accept that we are a diverse community and diverse in our strength? A few days ago, Atif Mia talk was cancelled due to his religion how can we deal with this to overcome politics of hatred and exclusion so uh, excellent questions there yes okay. well baha thank you so much it's first of all so good to see you develop uh, mashallah you came as a student and i know your own ideas from your own background you've begun to learn to love reading you you're one of the students who i quote as an example of change in perspective. So I really appreciate your participation and your support throughout. And that's a really good question you've raised. So yes, uh, our, co uh, our courses at FC, as you rightly pointed out, were very challenging because it was a challenging atmosphere. It was also a place where some of, um, in another school, interdisciplinary courses had been banned because you know there was some controversy around those. 
But in that atmosphere, we were able to teach some of these courses at Foreman Christian College. And you know, some of our students had their own perspectives. But at the end of the course, the students, for example, one of the students did say that people of other faiths should be killed, which shocked me. But at the end of the course, and after we studied empathy and understanding and the dignity of difference, which was the chief rabbi's book, uh, the student said, yes, ma'am, I'm a changed person. My perspective has changed. I love reading. So all this as a teacher, I was very pleased to hear because my students are like my children and then my like, like my little brothers. So I really was fascinated and pleased to get that change of perspective. And I think that's what universities are about, to challenge us. But you're right, at a political level, the change needs to happen. So I'm a small scholar, a very little person. And as you know, as a woman, I have had my own challenges. Uh, and sometimes I've been stopped or there've been uh, difficulties in my path. But uh, from my own uh, effort and with the support of my family and my father's been a wonderful support and uh, people like Professor Yakin and all have been there for me. And this has allowed me to do my little work in my own little space. And hopefully this books like this will be plugged in. You know, we will push, our, we will make it our, our best effort to get the government to listen, to get the Higher Education Commission perhaps to discuss these ideas, the Council of Islamic Ideology to be aware of them. And that's how change happens step by step. It's difficult, but one individual can't do it. We've all got to uh, unite. And by we, I don't mean just a little pocket of people in Pakistan. I mean, uh, all our friends around the world, across the world, whether they are in the UK, or in Pakistan or in America, all people who want this world to be a better place, who want to bring in positive change. We've got to make efforts of having debates, having uh, academic and scholarly debates, but also scholars must feed into policy. So I really appreciate your question, Baha, and I wish you all the best. And I hope you go on to do your PhD and uh, influence society yourself and join the team of peace builders. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> if I can just <clears throat> follow on from Baha's question, because it is um, it is very hard to do the kind of work that you did in Pakistan without facing many challenges in, with regards to your personal safety, to the safety of your team who are working with you, because you are doing something that is challenging and, and people have faced exclusions when they've worked on interfaith or when they've looked to include um, the minorities within the broader conversation. So I, I just wanted to ask you, you know, how was it for you and your team with regards to personal safety? Was that something that you had to build into your research program as you went around doing this very important work? Were you targeted? Did you, what are the kind of tools? I mean, it, it's easy for me to talk about it sitting from in London. It's very hard to be Dr. Hothi in, um, in those various places that you've been in, in Pakistan, talking to the various communities and amplifying the voices without encountering the kind of uh, rigidity and um, closure that we've seen very um, a number of people face. And some people have, have paid for that with their lives, literally. So I'm, I'm just wondering, it would be really, if, if it's possible for you to talk about that a little bit, it would be interesting to hear. Well, uh, that's a difficult question. But um, yes, there have been challenges. And I think the challenges, again, uh, we tend to see things in slightly black and white, um, uh, in a black and white picture. And I'd like to step away from that because I do think that this extreme narrative is present, uh, a stream of it is present globally. So I see it. Um, I see it in America, I see it in the UK in some, some regions, I do see it in Pakistan, 
in India. They're different places of the world where we do have that narrative and we need to really encourage the other narrative, which I'm trying to, uh, you know, sort of um, make space for in my work, which is bring in the perspective of the people themselves, because sometimes they find themselves voiceless and to give voice to those people is um, very important for me as a uh, as an, uh, a scholar, as a person who's learning, but also someone who really feels for those communities and for our communities, whether they're in the UK, as I said, with the Muslim Jewish communities here or in South Asia with the different communities there, but also um, the larger Muslim majority in Pakistan too needs um, perhaps more opportunities to have courses, to engage with the Shahjo Risalo, to engage with these fantastic books and materials that they haven't got an opportunity to engage with yet. So this is what I would love to see because in the book, a lot of people from the communities, there's one girl called Saeed Gul Kalasha who's done a lot of work and she was on National Geographic. She talks about the need for a curriculum reassessment or change and to be more inclusive in the curriculum. So that's something, you know, that I would like to also look into how it can be done. And I know the Ministry of Education did have one or two sessions in which I was invited. And there was the need to reassess. And there were discussions with the imams and the uh, scholars in Pakistan, the religious scholars, in order to bring some um, uh, positive changes in the curriculum and to begin discussions. So although it's been uh, 74 years, but I do think it's never too late and it's important to begin discussions and work as a world team. So we all work together rather than seeing us, them, this country, that country, we all work as a collective, collective humanity. Okay, um, wonderful, thank you. So I think that's very, um useful to get a sense of you definitely see the change through curriculum and and that's very um that that is a challenging space as, as you're pointing out with regards to working with the state and then the different um different parts that deliver the education curriculum and getting agreement in dialogue that sort of agreement is always the the challenge isn't it but i'll, I'll turn to some other questions um there's a question from Eventbrite, background, I am a UK resident of Pakistani origin brought up in post-partition Karachi. I remember going to school with other children of different religions and I'm aware of the former Jewish community in Karachi. How different from today's Karachi? And the question is, so that's the comment, the question is how are your views accepted in today's Islamic Republic of Pakistan? So I, I guess it, it builds on the previous question. So so that was about uh, how do you integrate your views and this is about what is the reaction to your views? Yes, well, so far, to be honest, I've had a very positive reaction. Yes, I've had um, challenges from uh, uh, people, as I said, globally, there have been that stream, that negativity has been there. But also generally, I think human beings want to know each other. They want to reach out. They want to understand. If you really get down to the grassroots, and that's where I'm working at, and that's where I'm talking about. And at that level, people do respect each other. For example, Rabbi Aftab in, from uh, Rawalpindi, he told me, you know, we are proud of who we are. We are, yes, we are Jewish, we're Pakistani, but we're proud of who we are. So they, they want to, every human being wants to find a space for themselves where they're accepted and they're listened to. And they found those communities within, but we don't get that narrative uh, in the media, and that's what's missing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Hothi. We'll move on to a question from Mark, and I think this engages with some of your uh, global connections. Interested in your views on, uh, Mark says he's interested in your views on Islam, Jewish faith, interrelations, which you talked about especially given the recent statehood rapproch rapprochement between the UAE, Islam and Israel Jewish. Do you see this as a positive interfaith move or pure politics? Mm. 
well, I'd need to think about that question a little more. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, we'll um, going back to the book. Um, we've talked about the Parsi community. We've talked about the Jewish community, and you mentioned um, very important sites for the Sikh community and and the Hindu communities. And I wondered, with regards to the Hindu community in Pakistan in particular, the issue around marriages always ha has kind of come up quite a lot, marriages and conversions. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit to that with regards to the research that you've done in your book and how, how would you um, communicate, how do you communicate that narrative in your book? Um, I think when I interviewed even with the Sikh communities and discussed this with them, uh, they also spoke about forced conversions or marriages and so did the Kalasha community. So there is this, um, they, there are these um, uh, uh, stories of uh, forced conversions or uh, marriages that, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, then um, uh, you know, there, there is this discussion, but I want you to remember that the book that I worked on is an introduction, so it's not a detailed study of every aspect of religious life in Pakistan. It's sort of to whet your appetite so that you yourself begin to think of these questions, not just for Pakistan, but for how we as human beings live with each other with diverse identities together do we do we all want to build these walls or do we want to reach out and really understand and because there is an important verse uh in the quran which i'd like to mention which is your religion is for you and mine is for me and that is a sense of well that could be seen as both uh, in both ways but it's for me it's a sense of you know we can live together we should live together without this uh, necessity of uh, building walls. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Could you could you tell us a little bit more about the Kalasha community and um, where they are and it's the the kind of heritage and the history with regards to how you pre present it in the book as well. Yes, well, that's a good question, Dr. Yakin, because the Kalasha are, um, for me, they're a beautiful community living in northern Pakistan, a very small group, but originally it is said, according to one of the myths, one of the genealogical myths, that the Kalasha are descendants from Alexander the Great, who passed through that region, and his army married the local women and um, had this small group of women, so their dresses, their looks, they've all you know, got blue eyes, blonde, they're very fair. Um, they look very different to the local population and they've got their own stories, they've got their own myths, they've got their own challenges. They're a very happy group. So when we went there in the North, mm -hmm. traveling there was such a big challenge because there are no proper solid roads to that area. Mm -hmm. So our car was literally on the edge when another car was coming across. And it was a very scary drive. So I, I challenge you all to, if you are in that region, do visit uh, the Kalasha. It's a 17 hour drive from Islamabad. And, uh, but it's fascinating, the cultures, the dresses, the people, their stories and uh, their sense of identity, a very happy, very positive culture. Mm -hmm. and, and can you tell us about the context of Kafiristan, female priests, you know, all those things that that sort of... Well, that's a really good question because um, as Saeed Gul Kalasha told me, she's the authority on the Kalasha, and she said that they are called the black Kafirs, whereas the people in the north are called the red Kafirs because mm -hmm. the black Kafirs, because they wear black dresses with beautiful embroidery and all. Mm -hmm. So they're called the black Kafirs, but all of them, including their leader, Saifullah Jan, uh, who's one of the first people to get educated in that area, and they don't have schools or universities in the region, and they'd love to have those universities and schools. 
Uh, there, uh, Sefullah Jan said, we are not kafir because kafir is a negative word. It means you're uh, not a believer. So you're excluding us. You're not no longer perceiving us as one of you. You know, we're part of Pakistan. We're part of the, uh, the bigger picture. So we are, we, are, we are who we are. We do believe in God. We have, you know, belie we believe in angels. We have our own understanding, but we are not kafirs. And I found that point really interesting. And, uh, you know, it's to understand the people as an anthropologist, as a social anthropologist. My subject teaches me, at least contemporary anthropology does, to step into the shoes of the people and understand from their perspective so they're saying, you know, we want to be respected. We want to be given voice. We're not kafir. Please respect us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have another question from, um, this is one of my students from uh, my Imagining Pakistan module here that we, that I teach at SOAS, which is a, a wonderful rich module to, to teach, especially made more so by the students um, who attend it and contribute to it. So the question is from Georg. Uh, he says, relating to your remark on Rabbi Aftab, who said, we are proud of who we are. We are proud to be Pakistanis. How would you make sense of the statement? Does it not also represent an enormous pressure on minority groups to identify with the state and society in the hope to belong to the nation and thus be somewhat protected, which at the same time often is extremely oppressive towards them? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, who was your student? Um, Georg. Uh, Georg? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And you're absolutely right. There is that sense of um, being in a way a yatim. Yatim is someone who's an orphan. So you're, you're, you're wanting that parent, you're wanting to be protected. You as a community, this is the sense that I did get overall, that there is a sense of belonging and wanting to express that identity, which is part of the larger national identity, because there is um, another bigger debate going on with, you know, warring neighbors and all. And in that, the minorities don't find their, their space. So they're almost saying, you know, here we are, here's our perspective. Listen to us. And that's what we'd love to give that sense of space and understanding and respect. And through our subjects and courses, both in Pakistan, in the UK, and um, we hope to build more pockets where we can actually have more pl platforms where we actually bring some of these people, Dr. Yakin, on your platform, mm -hmm. where we perhaps have Rabbi Aftab, we have um, uh, Saeed Kul Kalasha, we have um, uh, Rati, uh, sorry, Perrin, Perrin, who's not a student from the Parsi community, who you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, she is one of the Zoroastrian teachers mm -hmm. at Canade College. Canade College is one of the Christian colleges in Lahore. Mm -hmm. And she teaches literature and Shakespeare, etc. And an amphitheater is named after her. So generations of young students have been trained and taught by her. So people like that are really gems, you know, for our human community and human family. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear their voices because they I'm I'm just a very ordinary small scholar mm -hmm. uh, and a student really who's understanding and listening and would love to see more healing in the world. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear those voices and these people and mm -hmm. hear their pains and bring them together on your platform. Thank you. Um, I mean, um, uh, it, were you talking about Perrin, Perrin Cooper, Perrin Boga? Or... Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So, Ms. so I'm a former student. Oh, wow. <laughs> gone to Kinead <laughs> College and, and benefited from the drama um, yes, classes yes, yeah. and, and I think it, it's well I've, I've had the opportunity of an education of, of privilege when I was in Pakistan and, and certainly been taught by a diverse community of teachers coming from different faith groups so that that has made um, uh, an impact in, in how who we are today as you said sort of small uh, people but it, it's the teachers who 
have contributed to that knowledge from from the past. Um, <clears throat> And Dr. Yakin, you'll be very sad to hear that Perrin's sister, older sister, Rati, yeah. who I interviewed in this book, she has passed away just recently. Oh, I'm so sad. So she was based in India and Perrin, mm -hmm. as you know, was based in Lahore. And she taught, uh, you know, wonderful students like you who have, yourself have become a great scholar. And uh, so you have that divide. And so the, pay, the divide is very painful because these barriers that countries have laid out, that colonial past has laid out, that, um, you know, has divided people. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to get us to think about how we can overcome those mm -hmm. challenges. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry to hear about, uh, about the sort of passing away. Um, that's very sad. And and how do you sort of share the pain and and you know that's an additional pain, isn't it, with regards to being in different places and the global sort of mm -hmm. issues and the national divisions both come together quite uh, negatively in in, the, in those moments of of loss and sorrow. Um, there's some more questions coming up uh, from Bushra Fatma. How did you navigate the complex power structures? between you, someone who is Pakistani, but also comes from an arguably colo colonial and social inequality, producing institutions such as Cambridge and academia more generally, and your interlocutors who share to some degree your Pakistani identity, but do not have access to the complex privileges that form your framework and identity. So it's a question of about access to education and having the access and those who don't have the access, how do you navigate that sort of? Yes, yeah, yeah. Bush, Bushra, that's a good point that there are these barriers, there are divisions, there are privileges and I've been privileged to uh, study at the University of Cambridge, at LSE, et cetera. Uh, but you know, Bushra, I started in Waziristan under that tree with my takhta, with my little wooden board. So uh, I've seen both worlds and I'm using my knowledge to the best of my ability, not in a perfect way, in a very human, imperfect way, um, but to give voice to the communities and the minorities. And I hope that it will allow some sort of debate and some sort of positive interaction to take place. Okay, so... Um... That, that's uh, very good to hear. And um, Bushra, as you know, at SOAS here, we're doing uh, this, the decolonized, um, de decolonizing knowledge festival, and we have the decolonizing working group and the decolonizing teaching toolkit. Um, and it's, it's a trying to improve access and um, to, to education in where we are and to improve also how um, students then get assessed and what are the attainment gaps. Those are some of the debates we've been uh, having and responding to here at SOAS. So I think it's, it's an ongoing situation for us, but it's a very active participation in the process of decolonizing the question of access in education and, and one uh, that I'm uh, very passionate about and, and certainly try and uh, make these spaces more inclusive um, and it's not an easy journey it, it takes a there are lots of structural challenges along the way that we encounter and that we try and shift and and certainly I think we will be continuing to do that as much as possible and contributions and students uh, voices are very important to this process. Uh, there's a question from, um, I think, I I'm sure they're not called Eventbrite, but, but it's a question from Eventbrite, um, asking the citizens of Pakistan need to be reminded that the white third of the national flag is for the minorities. Does it not come down to education by logic rather than rote? In addition, there must be greater respect, tolerance and understanding to achieve a multicultural society in Pakistan today. So that's a question for you, Dr. Hothi, if um, perhaps yeah. it connects with your influence from uh, Jinnah's um, work as well. 
Yes, well, that's a really important question and uh, a point because that's exactly what our work is about. It's to, you know, challenge those narratives and work towards diversity, respect for minorities, etc. So, um, of course, uh, also Kaidiyazm, you know, the whole narrative of um, uh, giving space to minorities was an important issue. He called himself the protector general of minorities. And although the white space was uh, designed for minorities, you know, it's, I think it's not that rigid. It's not black and white. It's not just green and white. There's much more complexity. And that's the complexity that universities and scholarly debates can bring out. And of course, my book is not, I don't claim it to be a scholarly work. I claim it to be just an introduction and for you all to now take up the flag and do your own research and do your own uh, reaching out and understanding and what Dr. Yakina is doing is very important because she's building that platform for these sort of debates so that we can uh, really begin to open up that space because this is this debate itself and bringing these points of views together is an important space that she's creating. Thank, thank you. That's very generous. I think it, it's a community effort. I'm, I'm just sort of a, a part of the wheel. Um, there's, I just wanted to ask you, going back to the book, there's, there's some more questions coming up that we'll come back to. And please keep putting in your questions. It's great to have them. Thank you for being so participatory to the audience who are listening. Um, could, could we talk a little bit about the Buddhist community, the Gandhara civilization? And I mean, there's been that whole narrative, hasn't there, with the Taliban and the, the, the kind of the destruction of sites and architecture. And one of the things that actually really attracted me about your book as well, a beautiful sort of sites of the minority communities and their relationships through 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 those kind of um, places architecturally, what's available, and then also creating their own narratives and con uh, contexts as much as possible. Uh, but there, and there are many, but if, can we, can, can I ask you yes, to yes, sort of yes. expand a bit on the Gandharas? Yes, well, uh, that's a really lovely topic. And that's a beautiful, um, really uh, topic for discussion and study. Uh, because the Gandhara civilization, and I explore it a little bit in my book through interviews, and I'm again as a student, I'm listening, I've got my note and pad and I'm listening to uh, people who are Buddhists from Pakistan telling me about the Gandhara civilization, which was a very ancient 1000 year old civilization, but it was one of the universities where people flocked to a little bit like, uh, you know, SOAS, Oxford, Cambridge, these sort of universities, or any other university with prominence and people would come here and study and studying and teaching alone was the prize. So professors didn't expect a salary, but they, the, the prize was the teaching. And so it was this wonderful vibe. It's almost like a ut utopian idea of, you know, the, the, the most um, special kind of education. So that was a Buddhist uh, civilization there in Gandhara. And then I encountered this very small community in Sindh, and that's the Buddhist community. And uh, the leader of the community was Juman Saab. And he told me about the poverty, the extreme poverty and the difficulty and challenges that they're all facing. And also that they're not heard. Nobody's, you know, no politician or nobody's really come down to listen to them or to give them space. And that really pained me. I really wanted to, you know, sort of help or reach out or connect because it's a small community, they're 200, but they are again neglected in sin. But I've got pictures of them in the book. And again, I'd love to, uh, you know, with people reading the book, maybe they'll begin to uh, discover and listen to them because one or two people who were interested in the book, they did not know about Buddhists in sin and they were really fascinated and there were people in the parliament so I, I thought maybe that's a good space but what Dr. Yakin has raised is a really good point about the Taliban and how the the Bamiyan uh, statues of Buddha were blown up now that was a very sad unfortunate event and obviously a clear lack of understanding of Buddhism because when 
I was ignorant and I did not study Buddhism. I too had certain ideas about Buddhism, which I, it was purely due to my own ignorance. But once I began to discover and study Buddha, who was Siddhartha Gautama, a very special prince, who was a prince, a man of privilege. He had a palace, he had beautiful clothes, he had a beautiful wife, he had a beautiful child called Rahul, and he left them and he went in search for humanity and for his own sanity and sense of peace of mind. He went to search for big questions and answers. And he sat under the Bodhi tree and he began to, you know, sort of transcend and really talk about spirituality and understand the world. And he came back with some answers. And there he was able to challenge some of the status quo and the people who were the religious leaders of the time, and also to encourage egalitarianism and respect for other communities. And Buddha also said the, uh, the idea of Buddha is um, uh, derived from enlightenment or when he's reached that sense of that space where he's at peace in his mind and buddha did say that do not build any statues of me or do not build any images so initially one of my interviewers interviewees told me that buddha emphasized that no statues should be built of him but eventually with time you know the followers like there's a really good pashto saying that the peer does not fly, but it's it's a Pashto saying, peer na auluzi, homurida ne auluzai. That means the saint does not fly, but his followers would have him fly. So there was this concept of um, the interviewee told me that uh, with time, as the Greeks came in, the um, um, Buddha was sort of deified, statues were made of him in line with Greek understanding and Greek practices. And that for me was fascinating because I did not know that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, of course, um, people like the Taliban or people who were doing those um, acts, those violent, unfortunate acts, of course, did not have the privilege, as Bushra rightly pointed out, to sit in Dr. Yakin's class and learn and listen and understand. And that's what we all need to do. We all need to begin to really search and understand and see, you know, what is the story? And those are the stories that I set out to explore and to understand as a student in this book. Thank you. And uh, I think um, if I can share uh, the <clears throat> A little conversation from German uh, that is um, included in your book, um, if I have your permission to do that. Um, uh, you say, I asked German who his role models were, and he replied, my dada, grandfather, was my hero, but he was unbirth, illiterate, he used to go to communities and help people and give them lectures and tell them. Quote, give your children education so you learn the strengths within you. Educate your children so that they understand themselves. From almost no literacy now, there is about 20%. Everyone wants literacy. I mean, this is, I think, your voice. Everyone wants literacy or I'm not sure if this is German's voice still. For everyone wants literacy so they can get out of Ghurbet poverty. We are small people and we hope that someone will listen to our Ava's voice. But because we are a small minority, people ask what we can give them and we cannot give anything. Sometimes people want our votes. But if we have no voice in the Qomi National Assembly, there is no one who can raise a voice for us. However, we spend our lives and we make effort, mehnat, to make a living with honor, is it? I think that's beautifully captured in, in and and sort of just expresses that powerlessness of the individual within the broader construct that is um, around them and what and how to transform and change society is is very hard from that grassroots level to 
well, from, from, I suppose, because, you know, for, for the elite level, you can get very comfortable where you are and what you do. And, and these, these are the uncomfortable spaces that we need to inhabit and we need to interact and dialogue and engage with that you do in your book. And that, that's absolutely wonderful to see. And, um, and I think it also, um, also is, with him, you pick up the question about Pakistani identity. And I think this responds to an earlier question. And if I have your permission to refer to it again, that would be, uh, um, you say, speaking about his Pakistani identity, he said, Pakistan hamaran, hamari ma hai. Pakistan is our mother. We are Pakistani and Pakistan is our watan, beloved country. Juman stated, and for Pakistan, we will sacrifice our lives. There is no doubt in this. Jan hazir hai. Isme koi shak nahi. Um, <clears throat> may the Malik na, na kare aisa waqt a jaye, to hamari jaan pehle hazir hai. May the Lord never bring a time like this upon us. But if the time comes, we will put our lives on the front line first for Pakistan. Um, and, and, and then, you know, he, go, he goes on to talk about his, his six children and, um, and giving them education and recognizing the challenges and the pains of their community. So I think, I think that that sort of absolutely captures what was said in one of the questions before, also the pressure on the minority community to, to validate the relationship to Pakistan even more and to say that I will live and die for the country because, because you know, that that is constantly the question that is being asked of the minority, isn't it? Are you faithful to the nation? Are you, can we trust you? Are you the enemy within? And I think it, it's very important that, that you sort of capture both sides of the story, you know, the story that, that they, they're talking about with regards to what are the challenges of being a minority community and at the same time of um, reiterating that sort of Pakistani identity, but not sort of presenting it as a straightforward relationship. I think that that's what was nice in, in the narrative that I could, that sort of brings it out, that, that tension. So can you then, um, before I go on to the next question, the other, another community that's very important that you talk about, and I'd like you to share more with, with the audience, with the listeners, are the Baha'is um, in Pakistan. Can, can you, you say there are about 30,000 Baha'is in Pakistan? Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all, all these faiths and all these um, communities, they're also connected to the geographical boundaries and the, and the regions that Pakistan is historically a part of. So it would be wonderful to hear more. Well, um, the Baha'i community, I found also a very uh, small community in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. But again, very uh, educated people, people who wanted to, uh, they've already been doing little community projects, healing projects, uh, discussions, debates, etc. Um, again, their origin is in Iran, and uh, the founder is Baha'u'llah, who talks about uh, the rights of women and men, um, and there's a lot of emphasis on gender and women's space, uh, and society is really described as a bird with two wings, and one wing is male and one wing is female, and without obviously one wing, society is dysfunctional. So I think there were a lot of interesting lessons in the faith, in the community, in the interactions, uh, which I've explored in the book and, um, of course, uh, detailed a little more, uh, especially in regard to the women. And I'd like uh, the larger Pakistani community to listen to that because uh, there is a sense of respect. But there is also that double-edged thing where uh, we do need to respect women much more as um, a society, as a community, not just as sexual objects, but as intellectual, full beings with full personhood. So I think those debates do need to come out. And I was really pleased to meet uh, Dr. Seema in Islamabad from the Baha'i community who taught me lots about the faith and then visited the Baha'i center in Karachi and young Rohania is running that center, she's about 27. 
and she took us around and showed us the uh, Baha'i Center and then she showed us the nine um, digits, the word number nine is everywhere on the building because uh, all the faiths are included, especially the nine faiths, including Islam and Christianity and all those faiths are included in the Baha'i sense of respect for the other. Mm -hmm. so I think as a, a student, I did not know about the Baha'i community, but through my interactions with the people, with the very educated people and sophisticated people, I began to really see their perspective and understand. So when I asked, you know, what are the worries? What are your challenges? Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave an answer, which was very unexpected, which was that, you know, all this is part of uh, fate or it's part of written, you know, God has written all of this. So, mm -hmm. you know, stop stressing, stop worrying because we have the Corona and we have this and that and all these mm -hmm. different uh, pressures on us. And their answer was, you know, chill out, relax, uh, take it easy and understand the world better. So their perspective was a was a very interesting perspective for me to learn from. I think uh, it's it's fascinating to to hear about the the, the sort of internal community um, contexts and also how uh, the religion's um, relationship to gender is within these narratives that you're telling. And in my head, I was thinking of the of the women priests in the Kalasha when we were talking earlier and, and those um, and you also map out the very particular uh, rules and regulations that women have uh, within that community as well. So you have this kind of empowerment of the woman priest, but then you also have those kind of purity and pollution rituals which relegate uh, women in particular places and here you in the Baha'i faith you have women at the centerpiece as a centerpiece of of the narrative and 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 that really gives you know a wonderful insight into the different um how gender is is sort of not uniform across the country but different communities are building their own or have their own particularities with regards to that as well and I wonder how they negotiate that. How does that get, get kind of negotiated within the broader nation? Uh, like, do you, obviously, I suppose you must see a stark difference between the Kalasha community and how, also because you're not in an urban space, well, in a highly developed urban space that you are with where you're, you're sort of interviewing the Baha'i in, in far more urban spaces and very kind of developed spaces. So in, in that in itself, those um, relationships to public space and private space changes quite significantly, would you say for, for women and how they are negotiating those, those kind of boundaries mm -hmm. and borders? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really fantastic and really fascinating question. And I think that's another uh, study for a, a PhD, and I'd love to explore that question. I know that um, you're right, that the Baha'is um, really emphasize the gender roles and especially the role of women, uh, and so do the Kalasha, and they have a different sense of space and um, movement within society than the larger uh, community, the larger national, mm -hmm. uh, the nation. But then there's also the narratives of Shah Abdul Latif Betai, which I mentioned in the Shah Jo Risalo. Mm -hmm. And if you study that book and use it as a source of study, then you have seven major stories. Uh, and apparently Shakespeare is inspired by one of those stories and wrote his own Romeo and Juliet. So if you see that he, his work comes after, um, for example, Ganjavi, who wrote Leila Majnu. Mm -hmm. Leila Majnu, um, uh, Soni Mahiwal, uh, Omar Marvi, all these stories, which are romantic uh, stories and romances between a man and a woman, mm -hmm. are deeply symbolic. They're all metaphors for the believer's journey towards the spiritual, towards the divine. And that, again, is, you know, Sufism, mysticism. Mm -hmm. And those stories, again, all come in the woman's voice and a very strong gender role is played here. So how do we look at these? But these stories are not studied in the curriculum, unfortunately, in the national curriculum. Mm 
Mm. That's the missing link. And that's what, um, you know, I'd love to, again, decolonize that anti-colonization of the curriculum because the more we have anti-colonial narratives, the more, you know, masculine in a way, the more uh, as almost abrasive uh, mm -hmm. narrative is. Mm -hmm. But the more we have a gendered, a feminine, a more inside out diverse approach, we get this um, fantastic array. It's almost like a rainbow and you don't want to miss out on the rainbow because you don't, you don't just want a white rainbow, you want, you know, those colors mm -hmm. or like a garden, you want those different colors, you want the shapes. And that's what we need with a nation. We, we need that narrative, not just in Pakistan, in the UK mm -hmm. and in America at the moment. So we, you know, we have these debates going on, but we need to make it a global debate about how we decolonize knowledge at university campuses. And then how do scholars connect with policymakers to bring about that change for the ordinary everyday person? I think that's a very, <clears throat> very important intervention and it's um it's it's you know so so good to know that you are also structurally part of the HEC in Pakistan and also globally you know you've been part of peace building um initiatives and actually uh, not just saying all these things that you are also doing them in the in your kind of work as as we speak and um this this book i hope will go out to a lot of people in those spaces so that they also get a sense of, of a of a type of a different type of pakistan that can also be achieved um than the one that is kind of um often um we we sort of get stuck with sometimes um baha says i'm a regular participant in their virtual discussions prayers and discussion our most discussion and prayers are led by their females um okay we have a few questions coming up <clears throat> uh, one is from azade sobuth uh, i hope i pronounced that correctly or apologies if not thank you so much for your very fascinating presentation and grand book groundbreaking work in decolonizing knowledge. I would be interested to learn if there are any scholarly or grassroots initiatives involved in this decolonizing process in order to create space for documentation and validation of local knowledge. In particular, I'm referring to everyday efforts and resistance of out of center communities such as Ismaili, Ahmadi, Nurbakshi, Hunza, Baloch, Bakhtuns, etc. Many thanks. So it's, uh, I shall I take a the second question? You, Dr. Yakin, that's a question for you. <laughs> oh, is that a question for me? Um, <laughs> Okay, well, give me give me a chance to think about that, and I'll, I'm going to <laughs> hand over to the uh, go over to the next question, which is for Dr. Hothi, and then I will think about this one and come back. Um, from an anonymous attendee, thank you so much, Dr. Hothi, for this very thought provoking talk. It's both enlightening and humbling to listen to your experiences and your commitment to the cause of peace building through education and beyond. My question might sound quite technical amidst the passionate discussion. India and Pakistan both are in turbulent times, fighting right-wing fundamentalism and the rich gems of religion are at a risk of extinction in the majority and majoritarian narrative. I swing between hopeless pessimism and flying optimism about the role of academia in shaping a stronger narrative to build a culture of tolerance. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's a great question, very important question. Um, I wonder if you have some thoughts on that. Well, that's a really good question. Thank you so much for your thoughtful and um, really important question, because that's exactly the point that I've raised. I've said um, in the book, in chapter one, in fact, I've said that, look, both countries, Pakistan and India are nuclear um, they have leaders that agree, disagree. They have, uh, you know, this um, communal violence going on in some parts and more so unfortunately in India, particularly with the Muslims uh, today. And it's a very sad situation. Um, and I do hope that, uh, you know, in the process, these communities don't suffer because they're really gems. 
as you've rightly said, and we want to preserve our uh, world, world community gems because it really belongs to all of us. Shaju Rasalo is not just mine or yours or one person's or the others, it's all of us. Uh, so please do read the Shaju Rasalo, you know, support the communities, understand them. And I do really hope and pray that the world leaders will have sense and will have better uh, understanding and reach out because I know scholars it's scholars' job to uh, build spaces, but I do think that we do have a missing connection between uh, scholarship, interfaith, and policymakers. And when we can combine those three with not just uh, teachers, but students and people like yourselves, especially the participants here, who've asked really good questions, you know, we need you all to be on board and to. Uh, help shape that narrative because we can't be sitting on the side anymore but we do need to jump in and contribute our little bit however we can okay so um i i think yes we are in very troubling times it's it's very very difficult with with cultural narratives being appropriated by both sides for uh for a kind of uh division that divides us into the us and them uh, narrative constantly and i think yes we have to absolutely try and uh, work i suppose build the critical thinking that is so essential to this process of um deconstructing the the false news that we get every day the the social media, which is important in terms of having the voice that you're not able to have in other ways through state channels or state net networks, be it in Pakistan, be it in China, be it in India. But it's also a place that is also used by states as well to to sort of in a, in a negative way. So to be aware of that and to be aware of how um, I think that critical thinking skill is is something I think somebody brought this up before about learning by rote and learning through different methods. So I think it's it's that method that is being lost in the current process. And we see that over here as well in the UK with the education curriculum and how the drive to remove or to change funding structures and funding patterns is moving more and more towards a kind of um, uh, towards an exclusion of the humanities and I think the humanities is very very important to to a rounded education and in those spaces in those educational spaces much as we need and value and um, it's very important to have the scientific knowledge and alongside that you have to have the humanities present because it's it's through that those connections through those interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, uh, I think that the word nowadays we're talking about is pluriversity, through those kind kinds of relationships, do we get a more um, a, a, a community that is more, uh, I think, engaged with what is happening critically around them? And, and you know, we're all busy living our lives and and sort of just making ends meet but at the same time what are the narratives that are around us who is controlling them to take back control it, it's important to to have that critical capacity and facility and to be enabled to have that and i think we're finding that that's becoming more and more a challenge even in the global spaces as as dr hothi has been saying so going back to azade's question i think I mean, it's because I, I'm i not a social anthropologist and I'm sort of not working within the communities of the Ismailis, the Ahmadi, Nurbakshi, Hunza, Baloch, Pukhtuns. I, so I think this is probably more for you, Dr. Hothi, because it's asking for what are the documentations and validations of local knowledges uh, that, that are possible in those grassroots initiatives. So I think with the work that you've done, did you... I mean, I'm I'm aware, obviously, of, of labor organizations in Pakistan and of um, NGOs and individuals and people who do do that sort of work. But is there a, a kind of concentrated effort or a, a sort of particular way that you see 
with regards to the decolonizing process of how local knowledges can be um, made available to, to people in Pakistan? Well, I think it needs to be more available. And that's what, you know, we have, um, but step by step, because, you know, I've just opened up a little space for the community, the religious communities. And that too was a huge challenge because, uh, you know, it's um, when we introduced the first ever course, Baha was a student there uh, at FC College. It wasn't easy. There were its own challenges. There were people who disagreed, who agreed. Um, and so it's opening up these pockets. And of course, um, the question is right. There needs to be more, needs to be more research, more studies, more discussions, more debates. And that's why knowledge is so important because if you uh, take the Pakistani population, uh, the constitution emphasizes that knowledge is compulsory for children from a certain age to you know, five to 16. But in reality, there's very few uh, people who've actually been to university or to schools and often girls are denied education. So once we begin to you know, get to level one, which is educate everybody, and then we can go to level two, which is, you know, this is my uh, humble opinion. Maybe I'm wrong or maybe I'm right, I don't know. But we need to begin to uh, you know, bring in knowledge and through knowledge, understanding and it's a certain type of knowledge as I keep repeating it's a knowledge that allows space for other voices for other perspectives uh, religious communal local all these perspectives must be respected all these communities must be respected and I really get pained sometimes when I hear that a particular mosque or a particular community have been targeted or their graves have been targeted I don't think it's fair and I don't think it's right by any religious standard because every religion that I began to study as a student, every religion talked about respect for other people, respect for the divine and love for the divine and respect for other people and other communities and also love for the communities. So that, that narrative needs to be enforced and strengthened and it can be done by people like you all who are doing your own work, studying, but also asking and questioning and uh, taking the work forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's um, a comment um, from um, Eventbrite and my name is Omar Khan. Thank you. And my daughter is one of your former students at SOAS, Dr. Yakin. Oh, that's lovely to hear. And you have both reconfirmed life is but a partnership and understanding. And yes, um, Mr. Khan, the webinar will definitely be available via a recording. I'm not sure if we're Facebook Live. Um, we have been for some events, but we haven't been able to do it for all. So we will, um, <clears throat> we will please watch this space. We will put out some information. Dr. Hothi, um, you, I know, I know uh, this has been a fascinating conversation and we could go on forever. I mean, I still want to chat to you about your uh, your chapters on the Sikh community, on the Hindu community and the Christian community, uh, as well as um, Islam, the diversities within Islam itself in the book that you talk about. Sadly, we have run out of time and um, I have a message reminding me that we have the next event that is going to go on shortly um, on this same uh, account. So we need to wrap up. So I wanted to just say a very, very warm thanks to you for a wonderful, energetic, inspiring conversation. Your work is amazing and I hope that you will continue to grow it further and I wish you huge success with this wonderful book and encourage people to to buy it when it's available. Uh, I think it's, it's in the press as we speak coming out very soon. So, so many, many congratulations to you on this wonderful book. And if there's any last message that, that you'd like to put out before we end, um, please can you sort of add that. And I'd like also to thank Sunil for his wonderful support for the session in the background and for, um, for sort of all the, t the tech and the admin team. They've been absolutely 
fantastic throughout this festival it would not be possible without any of them so um dr hoti any last words before we wrap up well thank you so much dr yakin i really appreciate the session um the efforts you've made not just on this platform but so many other uh, projects that you've done you've i know you've been at the cutting edge and at the forefront of bringing in that positive change which students and uh, teachers and professors need really appreciate your work uh, i want to say that the book um, the book my own book project gems and jewels the religions of pakistan has been a, a learning experience but also a healing experience for me because as we went into uh, the world lockdown with coronavirus i too was diagnosed with cancer and i've had uh, chemotherapy and um, 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 surgery etc and through the treatment uh, revising the book and editing it and reading the work of juman and the words of juman and the kalasha and the you know different communities gave me so much strength and gave me that force because it came from the heart and it came from these different communities who are so special and i just feel as a world family a world community family we really need to appreciate the good that we have or the precious the valuable gems that we have and it really helped me heal so i hope it helps you all um also to see different perspectives and understand them and hear these voices because it was for me a very energizing and healing process and there's a very special word in uh, one of the abrahamic faiths communities in hebrew there's a, a concept of tikkun olam which is to heal a fractured world and that's what i hope this book and so many other works like dr yakin your project will help with our world today in our own small ways so thank you so much for listening to this very ordinary small scholar uh, who would love to see more healing more positivity in the world thank you for joining us and thank you for having me on your platform thank you thank you dr hothi we wish you a, spe a speedy recovery good health and um healing and uh, you're an inspiration and as we end i have to give my apologies to rubina who also had a question for us with regards to hunza communities and the al khan foundation unfortunately we've run out of time um but we have seen your question thank you for sending it and rubina has been i think attending all the sessions because i have seen her name come up every time so i feel as if i should we should award a special certificate to rubina for for participating in in the festival so thoroughly and completely if it's if it's the same rubina but thank you everyone uh, thank you very much and goodbye for now and please tune in to the next session um i i should know what it is but i can very quickly look it up and tell you what we have next which is um going to be heritage and repatriation panel discussion return of the icons project it's going to be brilliant uh, please do tune in if you can and thank you for now and goodbye bye 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 <clears throat>